Hi everyone, good evening, welcome. Uh, we are going to have a discussion about Movember. My name is uh, Jack Parrick, I'm a Brussels-based journalist and presenter and we are going to be speaking uh, today. We're going to have uh, some conversations about men's health, men's mental health. Uh, I can see uh, that some of our guests are actually joining already um, and I'm going to try and bring them in. Um, so we are going to be uh, to have, as I say, a, a frank discussion about men's health, what needs to change. So we are in this month of Mo November, November. I think we are going to have uh, Tom van den Kendelara, who is a, a Belgian MEP. There you go. As, he, uh, as, as we say, you, there you go. You arrived. How are you doing? Hi, Jack. I'm good. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. Um, we really appreciate it. I can see that you are fully in November. I can see it's it's coming. Um, so we're. Oh yeah. <laughs> I can see it. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Good going. That's actually quite impressive. What what, what are we on? It's sort of ten eleven days through. Well, um, thanks. I think I think I think now is the time to actually do it. I've been uh, pondering the idea of having a mustache for a while now, but um, uh, this this event tonight actually made me do it. <laughs> um, but more on that later. I think it's uh, it's quite exciting to actually have a, a proper mustache for the first time in my life. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it looks cool actually. It's suiting you. Uh, there we go. Uh, some other people who hopefully will join us. I'm just going to look through this list here. Uh, Tom, if you can, if you can, while I'm doing this, if you can explain what Movember is to our viewers and why you are why you're doing this. Sure, I think um, I'm definitely not the best person in, in, the, in the panel to be able to speak in November, but I think what I do want to talk about, Jack, is the fact that probably there's still so, there's too much of a stigma still around uh, men's health in general. Um, we, we tend perhaps as men to be very proud of ourselves and have big egos and not talk about the problems we have, whether those be physical problems or mental problems. And I think Movember is really the... Uh, well, the initiative by excellence that makes this uh, an issue and that says, well, no, we as men, we should speak up about our problems uh, to raise awareness also, but also to uh, uh, raise funds for male health issues. Think about uh, prostate cancer, but think also about suicide among men. Uh, there's plenty to talk about, and I'm actually very happy that I'm uh, able to do that tonight. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. So I've managed to bring you in, Professor Ian Robertson. Lovely to, to see you. Hi, Tom. Hi. Hi. Where are you? Where are you this evening? I was in Dublin in the Global Brain Health Institute in Trinity College. Oh, great. In among real people. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are hoping to bring in Dr. Gavin Keane as well, but I'm not sure. He doesn't look like he's on our list of guests. So if he if he joins us later, we'll we'll bring in him for him in for the discussion. But we'll we'll just sort of uh, we'll just sort of get going now. I mean, Ian, perhaps you can talk to us um, a little bit about. Uh, why shining a light on, on men's health issues and why Movember? If you can give us a bit of a, you know, your feelings about it, essentially. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great idea. I love the kind of the, the cleverness of, of this moustache and the kind of all the masculinity that, that conveys, but also subtly put in, putting into that, it's okay to be, to be vulnerable. It's okay to be to be weak and that's you know the mas masculinity has certain advantages it, it, it can lead to confidence sometimes overconfidence but it can make us frightened to face up to emotions and we have between our ears the most complex entity in the known universe the software of that machine needs regular updating and men are afraid to update it why do you think that is tom why are men sort of different i mean are women so much better than it's, us it's, what, what, what sort of what, where, where's well, this all come out um, of I, think, I think we need to admit that they actually are and um it is a, i in my opinion it has to do with who we are as, as human beings as male human beings uh, as i already said a sense of pride uh, perhaps society also playing its role there uh, i think we can all easily imagine uh, a, a an image of men uh, at the bar drinking, drinking beer, having fun, but we, we can definitely not imagine or find it more 
uh, difficult to imagine uh, men crying, for example, and explaining you know what they feel and and, and show their sensitive side. The very fact that I'm finding difficulties in describing such a situation is already the proof that there is something there and something that we definitely need to talk about. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks, Tom. So as you guys can see, we've got Dr. Gavin Keane joining us, who's the founder of Men's Health Ireland. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Where, where are you, Gavin? Where, where, where are you right now? You look like you might be in scrubs. Uh, correct. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, great. I am, I am in scrubs. I just, um, I'm actually at home. I just came home from work for this. So uh, I, uh, I managed to make it just in time. Apologies for the delay. Uh, I'm in Dublin, in Ireland anyway. Well, the answer to your question well lovely for being with us i mean just just the first question to you we'll stay with you um what what are your feelings about movember and this idea of shining a light do you do you think it can be really effective absolutely um i i've tried my best to uh, get involved with movember ireland in recent years um to uh, i think its main role i mean it's a great it's caught on in a huge way and it's a great way to um, advocate and, and advertise men's health issues. And that's, that's its main function for me. Uh, from my perspective, anything that can uh, further promote uh, the need for men to um, check in regularly on their own health, mental and physical is, is a good thing. And um, I can't think of too many other um, uh, campaigns or, or, or any kind of other um, activity that have caught on in the way that Movember has uh, internationally. So it's, it's a huge success. Uh, and it targets um, some really essential aspects of men's health, uh, both suicide and mental health, and also um, prostate and testicular cancer as well, which are uh, amongst the main health issues that, that really can sneak up on guys. And, and often uh, there's a lot of uh, lack of knowledge about it. So I think it's a great thing. So you, you've, you've, you've mentioned there the two sort of main aspects that we're going to talk about. The first one being suicide and that being such a huge issue, especially in young men and um and cancer so prostate and testic testicular cancer let's let's start to discuss the, the sort of issue of suicide which is obviously something that even as i'm starting to start this discussion i feel nervous to talk about and i think that is that's a sign in itself that we are slightly nervous about these topics what uh, the, the statistic is is that every 60 seconds someone somewhere in the world a, a, a man takes his own life in how are we going to bring that statistic down and how can we do it in Europe at least? I mean, we can start, you know, closer to home rather than looking at the global stats. Personally, I think it has to start in, in the schools and education. I think, I think we're, we, we don't supply users' manuals to our human beings as they grow up with this most complex entity in the known universe between their ears. And um, suicide is a ghastly... Um, response to a feeling of hopelessness uh, about the future and um, men, women commit suicide less often be, but they're also more vulnerable to anxiety than men men's response to anxiety is to take action generally or to drink alcohol uh, and suicide is one form of ghastly action that they can take in response to internal distress a, a lack of hope comes from a distorted view of the world um, and, and that distortion can be corrected if you talk to people, if you, if you allow yourself to express your distress. So we have, to, we have to give people a user's manual for the brain and we have to uh, allow people to, to, to confess to, to problems the way their, their mind is functioning and to, and to seek help. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. And I know, you know, it's confronting for everyone. Tom, we've just had, you know, this pandemic, which has just been... A mental health crisis across the board for everybody there's no question about it that that's happened what can we do what where where does the uh, so so ian they're suggesting that this needs to be in schools parents uh, workplaces who else the eu you I mean you, you're an mep how can we yes i think it, it needs to be an encompassing approach really um Two, yeah. About two weeks ago, a friend of the family in, in our age group, uh, a bit younger than me, uh, committed suicide. Uh, afterwards, we tried to understand what happened. And, and the main reason he, he must have said himself was that he considered himself to be a failure, a failure in life. Um, and probably even the COVID lockdown has definitely to do with that. Um, because those are moments where you obliged to, to think more about yourself and where you actually have the time to think more about yourself and to, to see what, 
what are the, the bad things that are um, crossing your mind. Um, schools definitely is a very good starting point, but I think as, as uh, policy makers, uh, you need to develop an encompassing approach, indeed uh, talk about it uh, within companies, but mainly roll out, I think, uh, very wide uh, campaigns about um, mental health. Uh, I refer to, for example, a campaign we did in my home province, which is uh, one of the provinces in Belgium with the highest suicide rates. Uh, five attempts a day, uh, figures are showing today. Um, it was generally a campaign in which, uh, which, which was called WIST, and that is the general question everyone asks each other whenever you cross someone in the street where you ask, hey, how are you doing? Uh, and where the standard reply would also always be, everything's fine, all, all is good. Um, well, precisely this campaign that has run for about three, four years uh, was made to make, it, make mental health issues discussable and to show as well that there is actually an issue but, because I think... Um, not only do we need to uh, make people open up themselves to speak about mental health issues, but also do we need to show that there is actually an issue in our society. If you have five suicide attempts a day in a certain region, then this is an issue and you need to, you need to discuss this. Um, so I think those two components, there is definitely a role for policymakers there. How much of this, uh, Gavin, is like a, a healthcare issue as well, as opposed to a I mean, I wonder if you could talk to how sort of healthcare systems are set up to deal with this issue of suicide and whether whether they're, they're I mean, I'm not, you know, whether they have the capacity to, to do it at the moment. The answer to that is no. Um, I can only really speak for Ireland and, and uh, I hesitate to do that uh, as, as an individual. But um, I can say that the... Um, Health, mental health uh, systems in Ireland are completely overwhelmed and have been for some time and are even more so now in the past couple of years um, for obvious reasons. So the, the, the public system, I won't go into the details of the Irish health system, but the public system, which in theory has the capacity to absorb the mental health issues of the entire population, can't even begin to. So what has happened is a, a huge network of um, private not-for-profit organizations uh, of, of therapy and psychology and counseling have sprung up with a view to try and stem the tidal wave of, of, of mental health issues that, that are happening around us. Uh, and even they aren't able to, to, to handle it. So um, in answer to your question, I see an, like on an anecdotal basis, I see a huge increase in mental health presentations at crisis. Uh, and for people, unfortunately, this is the case probably all over Europe, the people who have the means can access private care um, and probably will do better, or definitely will do better as a result. Whereas the people who don't go into this long snake of a queue, um, and that is for more, th you know, that's very uh, huge issue in, in you know, time, time relevant medical conditions, but in a suicide risk situation, it's enormous um, and, and you're left somewhat helpless in some ways uh, as a physician looking to help these people with, with no access to care. Um, so uh, in, in with a view to, to what needs to happen from a healthcare systems point of view, it just needs to be bigger, really. Um, and and uh, that's an unbelievably simple and simplistic uh, dive down in, into the problem, but we simply don't have the capacity to handle this problem. Yeah. And un until that changes, then it it's it's just it's just the status quo, which is, is unacceptable, really. Ian, perhaps you can talk about how important it is for policies to change. I mean, how I mean, Movember is all well and good and, you know, good for shining a light. But if we're really going to tackle the issue, I wonder what your top priorities would be to, to bring the rates down of, of suicide, to get men into the help that they need. So. Uh, in the 1950s, all my, it was very common for your friends' parents to drop dead of heart attacks in the 50s and 60s. And it was seen to be part of life, part of growing up. Uh, then in America, they had the Framingham study where they discovered that there were these variables that predicted people's vulnerability to heart disease to do with exercise, monitoring blood, blood pressure and diet. And you had this amazing uh, nobody jogged or went out running when I was a, a boy. Now everyone does. And physical health has become a value 
that people aspire to and has resulted in heart disease uh, being half, more than half, reduced by 60% over half, half a century. That, didn't, that wasn't due to advances in medicine, that was due to a public awareness and the growing of a fashion. We can do the same for brain health. Uh, and I think mental health is an aspect of brain health. Brain health also encompasses risk of dementia, et cetera. So if we have the, we have the possibility to make people uh, enthusiastic about developing the, the, the capacities and health of their brain in a way that's not threatening and stigmatized, that sometimes mental health problems can be. If we do that, then that will be one of the biggest uh, policy measures we can have in order to reduce many of the terrible problems we're talking about today. Yeah, it's that's an interesting concept. I just want to say to anyone that is listening into our conversation that if you are feeling in any way, uh, you know, in trouble and are having some sort of internal, uh, you know, crisis, that you should reach out, try and talk to someone and get out there. Uh, I mean, I am somebody that has spent a, a many, many hours in therapy, and I'm happy to talk openly about that. It's been a huge use to me. And if you if you have the ability to do that, and if you if where you are, the healthcare system is is able to to support you, then just just go and do it. Just go and get yourself supported. So, Tom, I know that you think that there is. Um, a need for us to look at sort of work-life balance as well in all of this. I mean, it's, I think the pandemic, especially this idea of, you know, not being able to switch off, et cetera. How can you as a policymaker help EU citizens on, on, on that front? How, what can you, what can you do uh, to give people a bit of a break? You know, um, it was really the pandemic that made me realize, or at least being stuck at home, that made me realize uh, that there was something seriously wrong with the way in which I thought I had a good work-life balance. It's not because that you, it's not because you, you you spend a weekend away with your wife in Paris that uh, you solve uh, or you have a proper work-life balance. And work-life balance is not only about um, having a family or having well, whichever shape that, that family might take and having that family, uh, in, that family life in balance. It's also about a work-life balance on your own. Um, and what I, what I tend to notice uh, among friends, among family as well, is that especially in, um, in this age group, uh, there is a, a type of attitude that the, the more you work, the better that is. Um, the, the, the more ambitious you are in, in life and the more uh, time you spend at your job, the better that is and the better uh, esteem or perception you get from, from others. Um, I remember having calls with friends uh, driving home, for example, at four o'clock in the afternoon, people asking me, what's happening? Are, are you ill? Uh, is there an issue? Um, it, is, it, it are these types of, of um, simple questions and simple societal um, sentences that are being used on a daily basis that make it that our work-life balance and the way in which we actually think about our work-life balance is completely wrong. Um, and personally, I realize it the most, uh, not only in this lockdown, but uh, right before it, when, um, when I would get back from work after f many days away, even from home uh, on a mission abroad and where my, my youngest son, you know, would look at me and, and not recognized me uh, directly uh, that that was to me that was a really shocking uh, a moment a moment at which i realized that i, I never wanted to have a, a work-life balance like that anymore it is good to have a proper career it is obviously necessary to uh, to earn for a living that is for sure but it shouldn't go at all cost and um uh, it definitely shouldn't go at the cost of, of your mental health, which is the most crucial bit in, um, in, actually, in actually being successful, as paradoxic or as it might seem. Exactly. Turning off can often be the best way to solve any kind of problem as well. Uh, okay, just because just we don't have, you know, a whole uh, load of time. I mean, this is an issue that we can talk about for, for a long time. But let's move on perhaps to more sort of direct physical health. Um, and Gavin, perhaps you can talk to this. this I, there's a, a big problem with men not getting checked for things like testicular and prostate cancer. What needs to change there? Unfortunately, it's quite a similar situation where there's a, a widespread resistance 
Um, I think it probably internationally, but certainly here, uh, for men to get a regular check for certain symptoms, there's a huge amount of factors, and I think Ian can probably speak to this better than I can in terms of men's natural resistance to seeking help. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what, what I won't expand fully on that, what I will talk about is, is the reasons why men should get checked, which is, is uh, I think, probably what it really boils down to. Um, there's a statistic that's true the world over where men die younger than women. That's true in every country in the world. Um, and it's true in Ireland as well. So this has always stuck with me right through my training. And it's, it's, it's something that I've tried to address by, by raising uh, the need for men to get checked regularly as often as I can, whenever, whenever I can. One of the main things about men's health is that there's a sense that you're, men need to be strong, that men, it's weak to seek for help. And this is true of mental health and physical health and they just kind of ride it and tough it out. The other kind of sneaky thing about men's health uh, and the things that cause men to die younger than women is a lot of them appear early without symptoms and cause their damage in the background until long before you're aware of them. What I'm speaking of here are, are, are symptoms such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, high blood sugar, and also prostate and testicular cancer. Uh, which is uh, part of mem November's main themes. So the thing that they all have in common is early on in the disease, they can do their nasty work in the background and damage the body without the man ever being aware of it. So this is why it's crucial for men to get into a habit and uh, 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 an imperative really to get checked regularly because it's early on catching these diseases that they're all very treatable. And the uh, statistic where men die younger can go if men get checked regularly because they can be found out. It takes you just checking your blood pressure, it takes a blood test, it takes a physical exam. They can be found early. And the great thing about all those diseases that they have in common as well is caught early, they can all be stopped. Yeah. So the, the habit of getting into a, a regular check for men uh, is something I propagate massively. And it would be enormous, enormous difference in the statistics of early death amongst men if we could get to them early. Mm -hmm. um, I'll speak specifically briefly about uh, prostate cancer and testicular cancer as well, because that's on Movember's uh, theme. I think there's a huge amount of um, insecurity about uh, and ignorance as well about the two diseases specifically. Obviously, um, if to contrast to women who have a number of imperatives to attend the doctor regularly uh, throughout their life, menstruation, contraception, pregnancy, menopause, they, they get comfortable, they go to the doctor, they get checked regularly. And guess what? They die. They die in less young than men. Um, but with regard to prostate and testicular cancer, there's a, a good degree of ignorance. I mean, a lot of guys don't even know what the prostate is, and that's perfectly reasonable. I mentioned in school maybe once in passing, and then you never hear about it again until you're older, and it's something that a rite of passage that you have to get checked. Very briefly, the prostate is a gland, sits below the bladder. What it does is it adds fluid to semen that comes from the testicles while you have sex. That is literally all it does. Unfortunately. As you get older, it grows gradually, design flow, if you will, and for varying, to varying degrees in men as they get older, it will affect their urine flow because it sits on the urine tube. So if at any stage in your life, your urine flow becomes radically different, if it slows down, if it becomes difficult to pass urine, if there's any blood or anything unusual about it, that is a symptom that you need to get checked because I think most guys would probably realize that their urine is changing drastically. They might attribute it to just getting old, but it could be a rapid growth of the prostate. Unfortunately, there's a sneaky side to it that the back end of the prostate gland is actually uh, where early cancer can often grow. And that is why we do the physical exam, which part of my French is involves a finger into the backside to feel it literally put your finger onto the prostate because you can detect early cancer there very easily. So it is an important part and that a combination with a blood test, which gives us an early screening, can find early prostate cancer and get treatment for that. Mm. Testicular cancer is for younger men, it's around 20 to 40 years old. Um, it, 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 is, it is a huge imperative for men to start to check their testicles regularly as a younger age, because this is a cancer that can be very easily determined. Uh, a, pain, a painless lump on your testicles or a dull dragging ache unexpectedly, a persistent ache in the testicles should not, cannot be ignored. Mm. A very, very simple ultrasound can find that, uh, can find, um, because it's not a huge area in any man. It's a small external um, less than a yes yeah. external less than a golf ball thing yeah. very easy to examine self-examine very easy to detect uh, an early malignant mm -hmm. growth with a simple ultrasound if if there's suspicion yeah so these are things that can be solved that can be caught early right. 
And the main imperative is to get men to get checked regularly and early. Yeah. Do you know what? I actually, I do a yearly blood test uh, about something that you were saying, not to talk too much about my own personal health, but it's quite interesting, something that's happened to me. I had a, a diagnosis that I have too much cholesterol and I, I, I ended up being sent to a dietitian and have had a, 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 a real change in my own life. The dietitian, I'm quite fit. I like to go cycling. I do a lot of running. Um, and this dietitian said to me, you have to stop stop th- equating your fitness with your health because they're not the same thing like you can go out and run but it doesn't matter if you've got tons of cholesterol flying around your body you are at risk of a heart attack so i've started doing omega-3 and i've changed my diet a little bit to try and bring it down and we'll find out in a few months if i'm if i'm managing to do it but i think that's an interesting thing this idea of i think men think i'm in the gym I'm fair. I can, you know, you know, they, 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 a lot of men equate fitness and, and health when they're actually two different things. So Ian, bringing, bringing you in, how, I mean, the idea of the sort of inspections that Gavin was talking about there, those things put guys off. We don't have those, like he says, regular checkups with doctors. How do we change men's, uh, you know, attitude towards that? As I said earlier, men are very focused on action and less inclined to look inside. And uh, denial is a very strong... I, I'm a huge person for denial. I, I shy away from all the stuff that we talked about here. But <laughs> men, men, men have to learn that they have to look inside, literally, physically and mentally. They have to learn that that's not weakness, that that is part of, of building that health. So I think you, you said about physical fitness, that's a huge accomplishment in 50 years. We need to make it more sophisticated in exactly the ways you were talking about there, a more rounded concept of health, of both physical health and of brain health. That means you don't just talk about how far you can run, but also what you're eating and what you're doing to yourself by the, your diet and, 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 and other behaviors. Yeah, we're in quite a modern world though, Tom. And there is this sort of idea that men are, you know, much more, perhaps more vain than they were in the modern world and take care of themselves in other ways. I don't know if you agree. And how perhaps we can use that sort of shift of the modern man to, to make people healthier and get these checkups. Well, like it was already said, I, th- I think definitely I agree that this is a more vain uh, society in men's environment where we, uh, for our moustache or beard, we even have products now to treat ourselves, something which my father uh, is laughing at. Um, but that also makes that, as it was already said, the physical, uh, the, the way of, of checking ourselves out physically uh, and the fact that this might also be the case in the future for our mental health, I think it's the right time for us uh, not only to be vain about how we look and how we shine, but also to be a bit more vain perhaps about the way in which we we consider our health uh, and how we look at our health ourselves. Um, And to me, when I was listening uh, uh, to Gavin and Ian, I think early detection, whether it be for physical or for mental issues, um, I think early detection is the key there. And the, the, own, the main driver to, to be able to have this early detection is, is the, the man himself. Uh, and we're eager and proud to do things as men. I think this is definitely one of the things we should be proud about ourselves is that we we're the earliest to detect something if, if something is going wrong. Uh, far too often still, and this might be something also from our past and from the way in which our societies were organized in the past, we have been walking around both with physical and with mental problems that we have not been able to detect early enough or detect at all, and that we would have preferred to keep, to keep silent. I think this has to radically change. And, um, and I think today's society, the way in which it's, it is evolving, is offering fertile ground for that. So I think we need to seize this occasion. And for example, also the beating cancer plan by the European Commission, something we're discussing here also in the parliament. I was just, a, uh, I was just about to ask you about that. Where, where are we with the EU can be ca- beating cancer plan and like, where does the EU come in on this? Because healthcare is, we heard like from Gavin as well, that healthcare is a national issue. He can really only talk about the Irish health system. What can the EU do to make this a better situation and improve things and through the cancer plan as well? Well, I have the privilege to, um, to be the national uh, uh, colleague of Cindy Franson, who is really the cancer expert of, uh, of our political group. Um, And so what I see and what I hear from the important work that she's doing is that you're right, the EU does not have uh, immediate competences, as it were, 
but can very much play a role in formulating advice and especially also, I think, in aligning, I would say, advice on actions to be taken in the different member states. Because the, the compare and contrast is something that the EU level can do at best and something uh, they can do not only at prevention, not only at early detection, but also at treatment and at uh, uh, quality of living uh, after treatment. I think those four stages, let's say, of, um, of cancer are the exact uh, places where, uh, where, we, where we best can formulate, I think, advice on the way in which uh, member states can uh, take successful action there. Wonderful. I think we're, we're kind of out of time now. I know you, you've all got evenings to go to. Is there anything, I always do this at the end of these discussions, is there anything anyone wants to say uh, before, before we hang up in case there, you know, something that you'll go to bed and think, ah, I wish I'd sort of said that in that discussion. I can see you, Ian. Just to say every human being is, is, is absolutely, literally as unique as the Mona Lisa in the Louvre because of the, the number of genes multiplied by the number of experiences. So every person is so incredibly precious uh, and, and, and that should give people a sense of purpose and meaning because there's nothing else like you in the world. Yeah, totally. As I said before, if you are struggling, if you're, oh, please Tom, you want to say something? I can see. Yes, I wanted to say thank you to Gavin because this is the first time in my life I hear how prostate cancer and testicular cancer can actually be detected quite easily. Um, I had never heard this before, and then this me, me is, uh, is the best takeaway of that. I, I learned mean, something yes. properly today. I, I actually was like a bit feeling a bit bad, but I re that was a really interesting uh, lesson from Gavin. I, 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 I learned Absolutely. stuff there tonight. Thank Thanks you. For that. For, yeah, I agree. Well, the only the only thing I'd add is to, to reiterate the thing for every man and woman listening. Uh, and I'm not just plugging my own profession here, but if you could link in with a general practitioner or a family doctor at some point and take this as a missus to do so, uh, the best news that I can give somebody is there's nothing wrong with them. And that's great news to hear. But doing it regularly is how you find problems early and prevention is always better than cure. Yeah. Okay, guys, listen, thank you so much for joining us, Tom, Ian uh, and Gavin. I really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who's, uh, who's joined the conversation and, and, and listened in. And just to encourage everyone, go to your doctor, get a checkup. If you're struggling sort of mentally, go and talk to somebody. Uh, that is the most important thing that you can do. And I wish everyone a wonderful evening. Cheers, guys, for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye.